A thing that you see in my pictures is that I was not afraid to fall in love with these people. That is a quote from one of my all-time favorite photographers, Annie Leibovitz, and it's a piece of advice that took me years to learn. Initially, I got into photography as a way to practice filmmaking. I needed to learn how to use lens choice framing and exposure to convey emotion. Now in the beginning, I was obsessed with the technical side of shooting an image and learning about the gear, but my work was just, well, it was technically shot right, but it lacked something. One night when staying at my parents' house, I found inspiration. You see, my mother was an amateur photographer when I was young. She would take these amazing portraits of my brother, sisters, and I that seemed so lifelike. Somehow, she could capture the perfect moment. That night, as I stared at four of her portraits, I tried to analyze why these images were better than anything that I had taken up to that point. Then it dawned on me. It was because she was in love with us. She had obsessed over all of our tiny human traits, our attitudes, and our curiosity, and captured them on film. Now, if you're ever lucky enough to meet my mother, first thing you'll notice is that she's fearless when it comes to talking to strangers. She has no problem asking those hard-hitting questions that help find the truth behind every character. I realized then and there, I had to change the way I do everything. I had to learn to fall in love with people. Once I did that, my work became so much better, and I still use those skills today on set, shooting films. Unfortunately, now that directing has taken the front seat in my life, I am shooting stills less and less, but I still love photographs, and I miss it. Luckily, I get to live vicariously through another fantastic photographer. She is full of life, love, and curiosity. Her point of view is strange, seductive, and beautiful, and she is one of the most talented people I know. Today, I wanted you guys to be a part of one of our countless conversations about the photo industry. I know you'll find it interesting, especially from her perspective. Without further ado, the talented, the beautiful, the lovely, Gina Manning. Hello. <laughs> How's that for an intro? It's perfect. <laughs> Not bad, right? Mm-hmm. I'll keep you. All right. So um, today, I wanted to just sort of get into uh, this conversation uh, about the photo business, about um, how you've come up. I've known you now for... Let's see if you'll get this right. <laughs> known you now for almost six years? Almost seven oh, years. Okay, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Time travel. <laughs> Time travel. Um, and uh, your your rate of growth has been pretty astounding. Like uh, you, when I first met you, you were in the nightlife scene as a photographer, mm-hmm. correct? Yes. Right. And then um, for those people that don't know what the nightlife scene is, what, what is that? Uh, it's where... Okay, how honest do you want me to be? <laughs> as, as honest as you want to be on record. Um, well, the nightlife scene is where uh, young children go to get drunk and dance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the technical... The technical night. So basically, it's uh, nightclubs that hire you as a photographer. Yes, EDM dance nights. Right, and is it the club or, or is it the actual promoter that hires you as a photographer? Um, usually, it's never the club. It's whoever's running the night. Right, and then they want you to come in and show, basically, take pictures showcasing how fucking cool their night is. Mm-hmm. Right, and then what? What were most of like if you had a portfolio of that stuff? Like, what would most of the images be? Uh, well, drunk people in really fun lighting situations. <laughs> Only drunk people. Only drunk people. Am I too close? No, you're fine. Okay. Just don't, don't pee it. Okay. Okay, so, like, what would a normal night life night be like? Get there around 11 p.m., shoot till 2 a.m., have a 24-hour turnaround for photo delivery, and deliver like 150 photos of the attendees. Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it, like, did they, was it decent pay? Were you getting paid decent for that? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. So then you were a young photographer at this point. So you were, you were chalking it up to a learning experience. At that mm-hmm. point. And well, it was like, they pay crap. So it was like a hundred dollars a night usually. And then I thought that was great because I was doing it five nights a week. So I made like 500 bucks a week shooting photography, like two months into it. <laughs> <laughs> Delivering uh, thousands of photos for free. Oh, uh, little did you know, huh? Mm-hmm. So, um, so you started in the nightlife business, and I think that's where 
I had originally met you. I think I was hired to do a promo for mm -hmm. one of the nightlife yes, things. Yes, you were. Um, which was an interesting, because I, I had no idea. I, I had never done that. So uh, coming up, I mean, I came up way before the EDM scene, but I still wasn't a club kid anyway, so mm -hmm. I didn't know much. Wait, no, you? Not a club kid? Yeah, shut up. <laughs> I didn't know much about that. So um, I think, I don't know how I met him, but I think I met him online, and he had seen some of my work that I had done for the Boston Phoenix. You're talking about a promoter? Yes. A nightlife promoter, promoter. yes. Yeah. And, and then uh, he asked if I would come in to do a shoot, and of course it was low money, but it was ultimately a bigger payout than mm -hmm. what they would normally do. Um, and it was just an opportunity for me to go and see what this underworld thing was about. Um, and that's when I had met you, because then you came as an assistant. To your assistant. Not to my assistant, that's right. <laughs> that's right, because I had Tony with I me. I was so. Tony's assistant. You were the assistant to the assistant. And I was like the, th the third person that they had asked, because the other like two ladies bailed. <laughs> right, it, but you were also like a very um, hungry young uh, photographer that was looking for For sure, experience. and I definitely wanted to get out of nightlife. As good as it was for me to learn about lighting and how to shoot on the gun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then you became the sponge, which, you know, for years you were asking for my advice and then you're asking for other photographers' advice and you've been sort of rapidly growing. Um, was there a, um, a moment with a photograph that inspired you to become a photographer? Was there a certain photographer that inspired you to become a photographer or was it just you wanted to play with a camera? Uh, moment was any time I had a camera in my hand. It was awesome. <laughs> And it was the best way I could express myself back in the day <laughs> when I was socially awkward, more socially awkward. Um, moment was when I finally took a course in college that had anything to do with photography and it was a film photography course. And my teacher thought it was 1973 legitimately, <laughs> but she let me play around in a dark room for like seven hours at a time. So she was awesome. And then I dropped out. And then I realized I wanted to be a fashion photographer when I saw a Stephen Klein spread in a magazine. Right. Did you want to be a fashion photographer before you got into the industry or was that when you were working in the industry? I don't know. I feel like it was always fashion orientated, but maybe because I met you and then started doing concept pieces that they were kind of a uh, horror orientated. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, I just sort of want to break this down because I feel like there's a lot of photographers out there and I feel like there are a lot of photographers that are at this point, which is working for a client that barely pays them anything. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them are in the nightlife scene. A lot of them are shooting stuff for websites and they're shooting like mass amounts of quantities and not really charging for that because they just don't feel like they have the experience to do so. So I think it's interesting for a lot of young people to hear how folks come up mm -hmm. and then how quickly they realize that you don't have to be doing that. Well, some people genuinely want to be nightlife photographers and tour with artists, but I never had any real interest in being a nightlife photographer. It was just the only inside insider tip I had into becoming a photographer because I was already in the nightlife scene. Mm. And, and, you know, without, I don't really want to trash on nightlife photographers because... No. We know a few of them that have done amazing mm -hmm. things and they have, they're good businessmen mm -hmm. and women. And they have uh, figured out a way to actually create a very lucrative career oh, yeah, for sure. in that industry. Um, but I think that there is just a mass surplus of young photographers that just do not know the next step other than like, hey, I feel really comfortable with a camera in my hands. Oh my God, somebody is paying me anything to mm -hmm. do this. And I get into this event. For free. for free and I add that artist to my portfolio for free mm -hmm. and this is a great opportunity for you I, I like if I ever hear that again I'm I have I, I'm gonna buy a gun when no that's kind of trashing nightlife again but you know per person that comes into a nightlife event is like 20 to 30 dollars so yeah exactly. <laughs> three people four people come in because of your photos and they've paid you yeah, exactly exactly okay so Let's fast forward a bit here. So mm -hmm. you're in the fash, you're in the nightlife mm -hmm. world, and you've decided that you want to do fashion, and it's not like you can just do a Facebook status and say, "I am now a fashion photographer." And you're going to get calls from all these magazines to do that sort of stuff. Well, it wasn't even. It was 
nightlife and then Janice over at the Phoenix hit me up to shoot a nightlife inspired journalism spread on food. So then I got into that and I thought that was what I wanted to do for a little bit. Oh, right. I Mm -hmm. forgot about that. I forgot about that. Remember when I called you that day on the highway? (laughs) I was so excited. Um, So, okay. So then you had someone that was basically enjoying your style. Mm -hmm. Because of the exposure I got through nightlife, which is probably the best thing you can get is anybody you take a photo of, everybody they know will see your work tentatively. Right. Right. And ultimately that's the reason to do it Mm -hmm. to begin with. I mean, for sure. That was the reason why when I started doing photography, I was shooting for suicide girls, Mm -hmm. actually, you know, which is technically porn. You know, it's like... Yeah, the the boobies weren't a plus at all. Yeah, the pinup porn. But I I mean, I really got into that earlier because I was playing around with photography and I was playing around with like high concept stuff. And what a lot of people don't realize is that high high concept photography isn't just like really cool lighting and really cool exposures. It's learning how to communicate with a production designer. Mm -hmm. It's learning how to actually produce sets, actually convince a location to let you shoot there. Mm. And you're basically, I was running my shoots and I did six, I think for Suicide Girls. Mm -hmm. I was running them like I would run a movie shoot. Um, And I decided early on that I was gonna shoot something with those guys for two reasons. One, uh, the girls were willing to do anything crazy and I wasn't, I didn't sit. I didn't get into that business to be that creepy guy in a basement. Also, with a Suicide Girls was huge. It was huge, then. right? Yeah. That was two. But the first was that these ladies were willing to do anything. So, it, I just seemed like I could show up and go, "Hey, I want to do like a Frank Frazetta, you know, uh, Viking set." I don't know who that is. <laughs> You're too young. Heavy Metal <laughs> Magazine. Um, so I, I figured that if they were willing to put shotguns in their mouth in a basement naked, then they'd be more than willing to dress up in these outfits and, and be put through torture on mm-hmm. set making these things look really beautiful. So that was the first big reason I did it. And then uh, the second reason was your point is that the Suicide Girls was massive. Mm -hmm. And this brings it back to your point before that um, it was all about exposure. Mm -hmm. So I would do a set for them and I had convinced the website with a bit of confidence and bravado that they should pay me more than any other photographer. And that because of so, I would only do a handful of shoots and I wouldn't be someone that was just handing them uh, quantity over quality mm-hmm. i already had a huge fucking problem giving them 50 images for that price um but i did it ultimately because you would do a set or you would have a set release and you would hit like hundreds and thousands of viewers in a day mm-hmm. um and then a lot of their members were like you know like rock stars like rob zombie and like the dude that created csi believe it or not like at that time there was a it was hip so there was a bunch Which of csi doing, i think it was new york <laughs> <laughs> I think it was New York. He's good. God forbid he listens to it. And he's like, this fucking kid has got no ah. idea what he's talking about. Um, but it's exposure. So Yeah. And the best part is exposure lasts even when you don't want to be known by what you started doing. Like nobody knows. A lot of people don't know you did Suicide Girls unless you tell them. And nobody really knows I did Nightlife. Any of my current artistic friends until now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm outing you. <laughs> okay. So... You get a call from the Phoenix, Boston Phoenix, which was an independent alternative uh, magazine. Mm-hmm. One of the or best. Or Stuff magazine, but the same thing. Was it Stuff? Yeah, it was Stuff. Okay, so it wasn't the Phoenix. That's right, because I was shooting mm-hmm. for the Phoenix. Yep. Um, and there was this was before a lot of these magazines closed their doors, which we'll get into. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get a call from them, and they ask you to replicate the style that you have been working on for nightlife for food photography. Yes, yeah, so shooting cocktails with eggs in them. <laughs> Okay, and I don't oh, understand. and beer and beer beer cocktails. And what were you doing? Just like a lot of streaming light stuff, or? Uh, so I'd go there, at not really having too much exposure, shooting somebody who wasn't wasted, and didn't already know what it was like to to work with me, <laughs> and see me for one second. It was awkward bartenders who really didn't want me there at all. <laughs> and then I just shot them, I don't know, pouring cocktails. And then I added, I said, and then a lot. <laughs> You can edit that out, right? <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> and then, and then, um, shooting light streams and layering them on in post. I would actually do the light stream work at night when I would go shoot nightlife. Okay. And then, so then you decided that you wanted to get into fashion. So how do you, with the portfolio that you have, which is nightlife and with uh, stuff that you've done for uh, the magazines, editorial, how do you get into fashion? Well, uh, 
I already had a couple friends that were makeup artists and basically I think I had like one makeup artist friend and I convinced her to help me pull together a crew where I don't even know what I said to convince them to be <laughs> in a fashion shoot when I have absolutely no fashion work to show. But I think I lied a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I promised them I could do it. That's cool. And then uh, what was your first shoot? I, I don't remember what your first shoot was. I, it was for Dark Beauty Magazine was my first shoot. And we shot, it was the one with the girl in the white dress and the man. It was like the only spread I've ever done with a man and a woman. Was that the one in the basement? Yes, of, of the, the graffiti basement. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. Now, did you talk to that magazine before you did the shoot or did that magazine end up picking it up after you did your shoot? Yeah, I had no idea at that point you could actually send them ideas and have them agree to it before you made the spread. So I basically just took that photo spread and sent it to every magazine I knew existed. And then one of them picked it up, mm -hmm. basically. And did they pay you for that, for that print? Hell no. <laughs> That uh, seems to be pretty normal these days, is that uh, no payment straight around. Mm -hmm. Even if you are commissioned, there's a lot of no payment in the fashion world. Oh, I see. Well, we'll get further into that. So then you um, do your first fashion shoot, and then uh, you get in that magazine. So then uh, now the phone's ringing off the hook, and all these magazines are asking you to shoot fashion <laughs> spots, right? uh, I'm still waiting for those phone calls. <laughs> No, uh, it was a great first magazine to have on my resume, although it's more horror inclined than I am these days, but they were still pretty big. So it, it did work in my favor to tell future magazines that I'd worked for them. One of the reasons why um, I think you have been so successful and one of the more uh, interesting things to watch is the fact that you are- Shameless. Shameless. <laughs> You are very driven, and I think um, a lot of folks will sit around waiting, and they'll do like a spec piece, or they'll do something, and then they'll expect, you know, because they posted it on their Facebook page, or maybe they shared it with, uh, they tag somebody in it on Instagram that works in the industry. They're just waiting for those people to call them and waiting for those people to bring that work in, um, and you have done quite the opposite, actually. And a lot over the past few years, which has been uh, very sort of self-motivated. Mm -hmm. uh, you self-finance your your shoots, and you aren't cheap about it. You actually seem to build your shoots in such a way where it isn't just about the final photographs, but you're also putting yourself in a situation where it's like, hey, look, I want to learn how to interact with a stylist, like a pro stylist. I want to learn how to interact with uh, actual models. Like, I, I really want to get into that stuff. So. Part of your spec, um, to me, that's been interesting is it's not just about the final image for you. It's, it's about putting yourself in the scenario in which you can learn to do these different things. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. I totally just spaced out. <laughs> <laughs> I was with you for like the first two minutes of that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's I think what we were just talking about was it's all about the hunt for me. And it's not I'm never satisfied with what I've just done. It's about what I learned from that thing I just did and what were people happy about, not just the people that looked at the photos, but the people I worked with and how, I don't know, it could be more badass every time. Mm. And then, you know, how, how different was it? What was the learning curve for you to actually start working with real makeup artists and real uh, um, stylists? Well, the first makeup artist was badass. I think I've always worked with badass makeup artists, but just when you look at some makeup artist's work, you can see it really does matter. At least, even if it's not in the final photo, when you start to edit, you'll see the flaws of somebody who doesn't know how to uh, put on makeup for camera. Mm -hmm. And then uh, working with stylists, like how did that change for you? Like how has that evolved? Only good brands matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good your shit is if you don't have designer clothes, usually. I mean, granted, my last set was plastic bags. <laughs> But for the most part, magazines are snobby and they need designer clothes in their spreads. Right. Just right. like agency represented models. Okay. So then uh, you're in the position where you understand these things, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're asking um, uh, two other pretty big creative uh, portions of a shoot. And sometimes the creative portions of a shoot, you're asking a stylist and a makeup artist to collaborate with you. Mm-hmm. 
how do you keep the shoot on point? How do you pull the direction creatively to what you need and what you want? I feel like it's putting up preliminary nets of, mm. of ways to guide people and like, I don't know, make them commit to one goal, but also have the freedom to make it their own. The first thing for me that's important is a mood board. It's the best way for everybody to have a pretty solid idea of what my general goal is, but also see a variation of just different things they can take the littlest of inspiration from. And then uh, is it like a preliminary conversation? Like where are you meeting most of these folks? Are they in person? Are you meeting them online? Like how does that work? Uh, it's rarely ever in person. Networking events, I've, I'm not too keen on those because it's just a weird show-offy kind of a thing and not like a genuine, I like your work. Oh, I like your work too. Uh, I meet a lot of the people I work with on Instagram, actually. So you see work. So you're sort of like sorting through Instagram, looking for people that you obsessively. Like uh huh. I see. <laughs> I see. So you stalk. You yes. stalk folks. Okay. So then you find these people that you want to work with, and then you just what, just reach out to them, or you tag them in your your stuff, or uh, I'll reach out to them. And if they don't answer there, I'll find any other way I can reach out to them and bombard them. <laughs> or sometimes it's just this harmonious thing where we both like each other's work. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, I'll get in touch. And so now you're finding it easier now that you've done quite a few of these shoots um, to actually bring in talent because you have the work. For sure. You. And you work with people and the people they work with see your work. And then you just make these awesome friendships, usually through the Internet, because, I mean, a lot of the people in my industry are in New York, so, <laughs> and I'm there sometimes. Okay, well, let me uh, let me catch the audience up a little bit here. Um, you've done two sets, actually, while we've traveled, or no, four sets, right, while we've traveled, because you've done, how many? Five. five okay, five. <laughs> you can tell I'm such, <laughs> such a dedicated boyfriend, I'm keeping track of everything. 16 if you include the New York trip you weren't a part of. <laughs> okay, so let's pretend, like, because we did a trip out to LA last year, mm -hmm. right? And that was a, I had been called out to do a couple meetings and uh, had a hotel room and, and you were like, hey, I'd love to go to LA and take mm -hmm. along. Um, and instead of being, and this is, this is actually really cool. Instead of being, uh, that girlfriend that sort of just tags along and hangs out in the hotel room and, Fuck that. and calls you on the phone and goes, when are you done? And when are we hanging out? You were like, look, I, I want to go to LA and I want to actually shoot in LA. Um, which was pretty insane because you didn't have any connections in that city. Nope. Um, you were going to finance whatever you were going to pay for out of your own pocket. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't have any location. So how how does that start? Like, how do you start shooting in another city? Well, you give up your sanity for two weeks or however long you have to plan the shoot and you get on the internet. <laughs> and you find every outlet you can to reach out to people. And it's just a, I don't know, relentless asking and sharing work and hoping for the best. And even when the worst happens, you quickly find a solution. So then who, where do you usually start? Do you start with stylist or? Um, in the beginning, I didn't. And that's a fatal flaw because if you don't have a stylist on a shoot, it brings everybody's motivation down. But now, yeah, I start with stylists. I actually choose models last because they're amazing and it's way harder to put together eight to 12 outfits in a couple days than it is to find a model 8 p.m. the night before a shoot. Right, which is a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And now um, for your models. Hey, is this on track? Am I doing a good job? Yes, you do. Okay. You do a very good job. Now for uh, models. What do, what we, do I do with my hands? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Your obsession with Will Ferrell. <laughs> I won't embarrass you too much on this podcast. Um, so with your models, are you just um, reaching out to people online directly or were you, are you contacting agencies? Like, how does that work for you? I used to do a lot of things. I used to reach out to just, oops, sorry. I used to reach out to women I found gorgeous. But again, there's very strict rules, at least with bigger editorials on uh, having agency represented models. So now... What you have to do is call an agency, get someone on the phone who simply gives you an email 
of a person you can reach out about casting and then you email that person and hopefully they answer you (laughs) (laughs) i'm not going to glorify it (laughs) okay so then if you're shooting because then you're talking about how off how long do your shoots usually last is it like a day like a couple hours eight hours like how long your shoots usually they are intense (laughs) they everyone always remembers them as amazing and very long (laughs) Uh, uh, I'll usually shoot for about eight to 14 hours. And, but that's from like getting to set to going home. And usually a good, a couple hours from that is just me setting up and putting away stuff. So now in that eight hours, that's just for one photograph or is that? It used to be, uh, now it's entire spreads with usually uh, completely eight looks, completely new wardrobe, completely new locations, and many hair and makeup variations. Interesting, and that's just because of the requirements that the editorial has for you, like the magazines would have? Mm -hmm. And also, why not, we're doing something creative, usually they're personal shoots, so why not fit in as much awesome stuff into one day as possible? (laughs) Okay, so then for one shoot, which is you know an eight to 14 hour day, how, how many days are you working on that? Myself, uh, everybody's spending, usually everybody's spending at least four to five to two weeks on their own. I'll probably spend up to upwards of a month, depending on how much time I have to plan it. Mm-hmm. So then you have a month of, and is that just you fucking around for like, you know, 10 minutes every day or is that like a month of hard? No, <laughs> that's you don't see me or you do see me pulling my hair out for... <laughs> that amount of time <laughs> interesting so then when you look at these sh- spreads and and I'll, I'll be sure to put a link uh with the info on the podcast stuff so that you guys can actually take a look at this while we're talking um but as you look at these spreads these aren't just you showing up on the street with a camera and shooting these things correct yeah no they are i don't know if i'm gonna shoot something personal it has to be this awesome world and i like desperately want everybody to be just pumped And if they're not pumped about one photo, I want them to be pumped about 10 other photos from that day. From my perspective, um, being a producer and doing um, um, advertising work for years, I think what you have done without realizing you've done it is you've actually made yourself into a producing commodity. Because it seems like these days more than not, um, I'm often getting asked to do a photo shoot for a client, like a corporate client. And uh, usually they have some sort of um, uh, creative director in-house that doesn't have any idea how to do logistics. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of the budgets for shoots are really low is because a lot of the in-house folks don't understand all the steps that are involved. And also they're not getting paid enough. To do it. Yeah, I mean, I feel bad for them in that position. Of course. And usually everyone I've met that staff is amazing and should be freelance. So, So then what's interesting here is that I will get these calls from people that'll say, hey, look, I have this budget. Here is a chunk of change. I need you to try to figure out how to make this thing work. Um, And you are constantly, I'm falling back on my producing skills from when I did independent film on how to like convince people to shoot in places and how to get people to do what I need and where to get Mm -hmm. the gear from. Like how long does it physically take to get lunch and how long does Mm -hmm. it take for people to get back in after lunch? Um, So I feel like the one of the things that you discovered Ooh, it's a knock on the door hey tony come on in oh, we're hello. talking about you hello tony <laughs> you're gonna take off what are you doing yeah. you're shooting I, something so tony has just entered the room mm-hmm. and told Glorious. me that he's not in, going in to finish gold <laughs> he's, he's leaving work early he is not going to finish the work that i tasked <laughs> him with today tony everybody <laughs> tony uh this fine dude no worries I don't know. But you know what? Walk away from it. The mouse is acting funny too, so they maybe. You know what? Walk away from us too. <laughs> now just walk away from it. Tomorrow we'll start fresh. Have some. Yeah, hey, have a I cherry. I clean them in the bathroom sink. Oh, this is nice. Ooh. No, I can't. I'm Did the sheets go in too? What's that? Oh yeah, put the seeds right back no, in the cherry. No, only my seeds can go in there. All right, get out of here. I gotta finish the podcast. I'm gonna get some math shit. Yeah. All right, get out of here. I'll see you later, you stupid. Where are you going? Why are you leaving us? What time is it? Where are we? 
Oh, okay. Hold on. I'm going to take a break. So, hey, guys, for this episode, I'm going to break up our sponsor ads um, just because uh, it seems like a better way to do it. Um, so let's hit the first one. Uh, first up is our uh, sponsor, ICANN. Actually, since this episode of In Love With The Process couldn't be done without the help of our sponsors, and since today's talk is photography themed, um, I figure we can really get into some of this new gear that both Gina and I have been using um, from ICANN. Uh, first up is this Nest Traveler Series uh, carbon fiber tripod slash monopod. Um, it's this really cool little tripod. And the reason why it caught my eye is that it folds up really tiny. Like it actually folds up to um, literally this bag that goes from the edge of my finger to my elbow. Um, and if uh, most of you guys that are photographers, you know that uh, if you're out in the field, there's nothing worse than lugging around this big, heavy fucking tripod. Um, and so when I saw this one on their floor, I ended up uh, wanting to try it out. Um, it's actually the first tripod that is a uh, photography quote tripod, which actually has that ball head on top where I can uh, tilt the camera to any direction that we need, um, which is a change for me because, uh, you know, being a film and video guy, I've always used film and video tripods and you're always stuck with that dilemma like how do I turn the camera. On its axis um so we ended up picking this thing up and it's really cool man it's very lightweight uh i know gina was using it when she was in new york on the last shoot and she had uh, nothing but good things to say um so uh if you're looking for a tripod and you're looking for something that's pretty affordable um i can't remember what the price tag is on it but if you go to ican.com and check it out uh it's uh, very easy to find uh, the other thing that we tried out from these guys, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, so bear with me, but it's the Nisi filter system. So that's N-I-S-I -I filter system. Um, and it's like this matte box that screws to your lenses and they have uh, step down rings to fit all the different lenses that you may have. And the thing that's great about it is unlike a matte box that you would use for uh, you know video, you don't need a rail system. Um, and the other cool thing about it is that they're now building it with a adjustable circular uh, rotating polarizer that sits in the front of it, which is really cool. And then uh, <clears throat> it actually holds, I think it's like 100 or 150 millimeter uh, just square filters that very easily slide in and, and out of it. Um, and what we were using and what Gina was using in New York were their grads, which are really cool because then you can take a longer filter, a longer grad filter than the lens is and slowly sort of tuck in that uh, horizon line where you need that horizon line. Um, so it's a really cool little system. I know it's brand new. I don't know if the circular polarizer is on the market yet, but I know it's coming out on the market. Um, so go to ICANN.com and check out the Nisi, or I'm gonna mispronounce that, Nisi, Nisi, N-I-S-I -I filter system. Uh, and uh, I think you guys will dig it. So thank you, ICANN, for sponsoring our show. Let's get back into this fascinating conversation between me and Gina. Okay, so we're back in here. So um, before Tony interrupted us, where were we? We were talking about, um, oh, the fact that you actually- Producing. Um, producing, you yeah. actually taught yourself how to produce through the back end. And um, for those of you who haven't sort of figured it out yet, what I'm doing here is trying to do the long way around to show that quality work and really great, inspiring photography um, is probably about 10% photography. Mm -hmm. And it's 90% prep. It's 90% production. It's all um, your interactions with other human beings. Mm -hmm. It's your ability to be charming. It's your ability to be resourceful. Um, these are all these elements in play. And so when you, you as a young photographer are trying to price out your worth, um, this, isn't like, uh, this isn't like going to work at a restaurant or this isn't like going to work at a retail place where you get paid per hour. Because technically, if you were to get paid per hour, you've done 
two and a half weeks worth of solid, hard, on the phone work. Oh yeah. That you don't get paid for. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at the end price tag, so if you're hiring a photographer, and if you're just a customer out there looking at a photographer, and you get a quote from somebody, and you look at this and go, oh my God, why the fuck would I ever pay somebody five grand for a day's worth of work? That isn't a day's worth of work. That's actually a discounted amount for the two weeks of prep. And usually the easiest part is showing up with your camera and taking pretty pictures. Right, right, because that's, that's Cause usually- Everything's all set up for you. Right, right. And then that, for me, that's usually the point when everything quiets down, like the hurricane mm -hmm. of stress that's sort of circling around that shoot. Mm -hmm. So as, true. As soon as you put that camera up to your face, then none of that matters and you're just shooting at that point. Yep. Um, so, okay. So that, that that's, I think that's a really good perspective on that. And, and as we're sort of transitioning into pricing, um, at what point did you start to figure out that you were worth more than a couple hundred dollars a day? When that wasn't feeding me, as this was my full-time job and I would spend, as you said, so many days on one project, it had to, to literally feed me and also feed my company. Right, because you now, I mean, you have to pay for rent. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I do a really good job of keeping our overhead down, and I've talked about this on other episodes, where you know we have roommates, we keep our rent costs really low, um, we try not to have extravagant shit. You know, there's always like a fund for travel, yep. you know, at, at like the drop of a hat. And it's pretty much, but it's work related, which is really nice. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, you know, you now have a studio, so you have a shooting space, which has been really wonderful for you, mm, right? It's getting pretty hot in here right now, actually. <laughs> I know. It's because you're looking at me. <laughs> how's, how's that for older man jokes? Um, so, uh, okay, so then you're now realizing as you do this for longer than two years mm -hmm. that you now have to make a profit. You now have to do this. How did you figure out what was the right way to charge for things? Uh, you break, you, you figure out how to price yourself by breaking down all the things that go into a shoot. And I guess the first thing I do is I figure out what the client needs exactly because that will dictate everything else mm -hmm. yeah because then you know a photo shoot even though your rate to show up for that day may be you know like fourteen hundred dollars mm -hmm. the client may be asking you to shoot like 15 people you know and like t like like nine of those people are women so maybe you need three makeup artists yeah with, with a big edit job if there are blemishes and stuff on the back end right so then at that point what you're doing is you're sort of you're going backwards so mm -hmm. if a client comes to you and Honestly, I feel like a lot of times what happens is a client comes to us as photographers and they say, hey, look, I have, you know, $2,500 for a shoot. Mm -hmm. And as the photographer who's used to just getting like 500 bucks or $200, they go, holy shit, $2,500? And they go, yes. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people don't realize is that you don't have to say yes right away. Your next response should be, and my suggestion for your next response should be, okay, what is the concept? What am I shooting? What is it going to be used for? Exactly. I mean, uh, in uh, another story in the music video world, uh, years ago, Ian and I were asked to write for Ozzy Osbourne, and we did a music video treatment for Ozzy. And Ian and I very similarly were working in the music video business where we were getting low budgets. And we had been doing so for years. So when we get that initial call from a client like Ozzy, who's like, I want you guys to do on your music video, our first response is yes. You know, and then we hear that he has, you know, I'm not going to give a direct figure, but let's pretend like the figure was $3 million. No, let's pretend like the figure was 60,000. 60, let's million. Pretend. Let's pretend. The figure, the figure was apples. Okay. And so he shows up with this amount of money and we go, yes, you know, because it's, two times the amount that we have done for our last music video. And then stupidly, we're like, yep, this is great. And then we start to see what the treatment is. And we start to see what the concept is, which is like him standing on a mountain, like an army of people all in fucking like armor and gear with swords and shit, and fucking smoke and special effects. And so then you start to see what that budget that they're approaching you with doesn't even scratch the fucking surface. And you're actually in danger territory. And the only way that you can pull it off is if you do your shit for free. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, when you're actually 
outsourcing and you're, you're hiring makeup artists or you're convincing someone to bring a classic car to set or you're doing these things, those are hard costs that you, other than you trying to bargain with folks, really have absolutely no control over. So at the end of the day, when a client comes to you with not enough money, that money comes out of your pocket. That money mm -hmm. comes out of your savings. That money comes out. And sometimes I've heard of photographers paying out of their pocket in order, in order to do this stuff because it is sold to them as such a great opportunity. That's the danger, right? Right. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I feel like a, a well, lot of folks need to understand that it's okay when someone comes to you and says, hey, look, we have $2,500 for you to go, okay, that's a good start, but what is the idea? What is the treatment? Well, and, and everybody who does it and goes through it, I mean, you need to experience regret and you need to learn lessons unless you have somebody i was fortunate enough to know you when i was starting to get into it and you warned me about this but how else are you going to know not to do it unless you do it first and well i mean regret it. that's why we're talking about it i mean I, I think that without getting too far into it i think that the photography business is so cutthroat i feel like people are so afraid to let other people in yeah we should all be friends i mean more than anything we should just be talking about what we do how mm -hmm. much we get paid for it because there's something about clients controlling our industry right now and saying, well, look, there are so many of them out there. There's so many people out there. So we can set what the rates are. And it's not even the client's fault, though, because they don't know any better themselves sometimes. Well, yeah. I mean, at some point, it's somebody's fault. I don't necessarily think it's the clients that are hiring you because they're usually on staff, really cool people that work for these companies. I it's feel the like. the system, man. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get too deep into it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to get too back. deep into it. I'm, I'm, I'm walking out of that. <laughs> um, my point is, is that there should be an open communication. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and if we are willing to talk about how it is that we price things, how it is that we bid on things, um, I think that's really important because not only does it keep everybody at sort of a level playing field, but it also keeps the uh, those big jobs that we all strive for, the ones where it's like, hey, look, I'm gonna bust my ass for like fucking like 14 years because I wanna ultimately shoot for Reebok. You know what I mean? And Reebok for their big ad campaigns pays thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for an ad campaign. And that's my goal. I've been spending every year and every waking moment of my life prepping sneakers, shooting sneakers, testing lights, working and meeting stylists and working and meeting lighting people, working and, and getting a studio. And then to get to that point where I can afford to pay for all that, I can afford to pay for all those people, all those promises that I make to the crew around me, I can finally pay out on, you know? And when I hear about photographers, younger photographers, that will do something for a company like Reebok or at least one of these giant brands for nothing because they think it's worth the experience, that is the goal. So if you're giving them something for nothing, then what ultimately are you going to have to work for? Does that make sense? It makes sense. Uh, you're also just showing them you'll do the thing that you wanted to get paid for for free. Right, because of that fear. Mm -hmm. The fear that no one knows my work. The fear that I need to have uh, stuff on my reel. I need to have this opportunity. I need to get into this room. So it's that fear that drives those decisions. Also be careful, you're getting a little intense. Yeah. <laughs> I don't wanna be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my point though, the ultimate point here is that a lot of those things can be fulfilled in the spec work that you do for yourself. Yeah, and, that, and what you want to get hired for is the things that you like to shoot, unless you wanna be more of a, you know, retail, e-com, shoot what they tell you, which is fine. That's a more business side to the art field mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it is very much so and there's nothing wrong with that not at all but um if you are someone that is looking for those experiences both you and i have been hired specifically because of stuff that we've done for spec mm -hmm. and specifically because of those personal projects that we pay for out of our pockets that people will hire us for after that it's never been a job i've never taken a job for a client that said this is going to be a great opportunity for you come do this for cheap and then we'll give you something better I never get that thing better. I'm always locked in at that, I'm at that cheap level mode with these people. You've been offered an opportunity for more? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Why, you haven't? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
so I, I don't know. I got, I got off on a tangent and a, a little bit of a lesson thing there, and I could see you. Yes, just be careful. Of, it's your it's your car ride rant that you uh, will never be released <laughs> yeah. somewhere in the depths with the Punisher. Okay, so let's let let me change let me change the topic. But it's good stuff. You're talking about good stuff. Okay, so um, so talk a little bit about what, what did you what what did you last shoot? What was your last shoot? You're so cute. Um, well, we were in New York. You were going to talk to agents, and I went and shot a, a couple editorials for Bullet Magazine. Nice. And then where where were we? We were in the Lower East Side. Yeah? Yes. So what kind of shoots were you doing? Studio shoots or? No, uh, the opposite of what I'm used to, which is street, 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 and run and gun <laughs> photography. What's the difference between like a street shoot and a, and a studio shoot? Everything. The sun, people, other people bothering you, <laughs> <laughs> and not having control over lighting besides scouting and see when you like the sun in certain places versus us when we just go crazy with speed lights and we can control it down to the most minute eye light. Yeah, yeah there's a huge difference in lighting and, mm -hmm. and the control over the elements is definitely huge. Which is nice because there's an equal amount of prep, if not more prep, because you actually need to go find these spots instead of making them in a safe area. Uh, but you also really refine your style because you're just using everything that's available. And um, is there is there like a benefit to doing street? Do you, is there a benefit to doing street over studio, or is it's all about what you want to get better at? I mean, if you're interested in learning, I don't know. That was a vague answer. Yeah, yeah. if you're interested in learning street photography, you should do street photography because <laughs> <laughs> then you will get good at it. Well, I mean, so you just did, and I've seen some of the shots that are pretty incredible. You just did a couple of really great um, shoots. Uh, funny enough, you okay? Here's a funny story. Uh, when we went to uh, New York, uh, I ended up getting food poisoning, <laughs> <laughs> and so we went out one night. And I think it was like I think it was like a steak or a dirty dish at that place that gave me that food poisoning. Um, but I remember waking up the next day, and you were using our hotel room as I remember the night of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were using the uh, hotel room as a staging area, so mm -hmm. you would have model come in, change your clothes and uh, get, her, get uh, hair and makeup done and all that sort of stuff. Yes, not in front of you, though. No. I will not subject my models no. <laughs> to a man in cargo shorts on a bed watching them change. <laughs> I was not watching. I was just curled up. But you were wearing cargo shorts. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I was just curled up moaning into a pillow. <laughs> you were pretty much asleep every time we came back in. Yeah, it was pretty horrible. Which um, is generally, I'd say, unprofessional, but because you are also a very good photographer, it was acceptable. I would not suggest anyone else leave their boyfriends asleep <laughs> in the room we do hair and makeup changes in. <laughs> um, but I got to watch when I wasn't sleeping. Uh, I got to watch um, you interact with the stylists and interact with the makeup artist which is really kind of cool. And it seemed to be, especially when you're doing the street stuff, it seems to be you're just trying to keep everybody's motivation up through, mm -hmm. the, through the course of the oh, day. Oh man, because it goes away halfway through the day when you're out in the sun. <laughs> yeah, because it just drops out at that point, right? It's, it's hot. It's, I mean, if it's summertime and during the day, it's hot, the sun is beating down on you, which, you know, takes it out of anybody after like 20 minutes in the sun. <laughs> so how do you keep everybody motivated? Well, it, you start strong and then you, you have to let people, or at least on this last shoot, I kind of had to let everyone go through what they needed to go through halfway through the day, but then, you know, be pumped about lunch and then have awesome wardrobe set up and good locations and just be really confident about what's happening next or else people are going to lose. That makes sense. That, that makes sense totally. And then um, you were working with uh, actual Ford models this time around, right? Yes. Yeah. I have, uh, I worked with Ford out in LA and my awesome connect there put me in touch with the awesome New York connect. So I found two badass ladies. <laughs> Which is super cool. And it, and does, when you're working with like a professional like a Ford model, is that different than when you're working with amateur? And I guess, does that change, does it change the way that you direct your models or is it all kind of the same? Yeah, when they're professionally a model, that means they have something they love about modeling and they know their body and they have a style that you don't wanna push away by micromanaging them, which is nice because I 
don't like micromanaging anybody. <laughs> How long have you been doing photography now, Joe? I think I went fully freelance in 2012. Wow. And I started fashion late 2014. Wow. And so uh, you've skyrocketed pretty pretty quickly. Aww. Pretty quickly. So where do you uh, where do you see yourself in five years? I mean, in five years, I want to be shooting campaigns. And that's the thing, right? Yes. Because uh, fashion editorials really don't pay much, isn't that the deal? For yes, it's completely true. Uh, even the biggest, the biggest uh, magazines don't really pay for print anymore. But they usually promise you campaign opportunities, so definitely worth it. I look. I don't want this to be too much of a love fest. Uh, even if you and I weren't dating and we were f good friends before we were dating, mm -hmm. I would still be giving you the praise and I would still be uh, talking with you on the show today about this because um, there are out of a lot of photographers that I know and that I work with. And another great one is uh, like Heather McGrath. And mm -hmm. she's also very similar um, in her dedication to the industry. Um, you've really been working hard at it. And I think that younger photographers could learn a lot from what you've learned so far. Um, so I'm sure, you know, people can find you online. They can talk to you online and ask you questions. It's like what, GinaManning.com or GinaManningPhotography.com? What is your website? Just GinaManning.com. <laughs> yeah. But I think I purchased Gina Manning Photography too. Because okay. there's another photographer in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> with my name all right so gina manning and then um you're also on instagram what, what plug your shit Where uh, are you at? Uh, uh, on instagram it's gina g-i-n-a underscore gizella g-i-z-e-l-l-a nice okay um and i feel like i've sort of been running the conversation for most of this whole episode is there anything that you actually want to ask me is there anything that you want to know that you've never asked me that we can talk about live over the airwaves not live but to hundreds and thousands of it's so creepy with your face just lit up by your laptop right now and it's just almost completely dark in here <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um i mean you've taught me so much you're so business orientated with your your work and but it's equal with your passion to create which is really nice um, what do I want to ask you right now? <laughs> I like you, putting you on the spot for things. If you were going to get back into photography right now, what would it be to shoot? Oh, weird. Okay. So you brought up the point that I have sort of a very business perspective. Non-money. Non-money. Like non passion first and then money next. Uh, okay. Cause, cause money would influence my decision. <laughs> And not because I need to make money, but just because I would want to have the the budget to do stuff at the scale that I like to do. And also, you're so focused on directing right now. It would need to be something to take you out that... Yeah. Um, I, there are some... I mean, I think advertising, there's a lot of room um, to do really cool things. And some of the few photo shoots that I have done recently have been in the advertising world. And... And often there is resources and budgets to do stuff that's really interesting there. Um, but pa passion? You love people. I do. I mean, I think for me, what I shoot, and this sort of comes back to um, what I was saying in the intro for the show. For me, it's all about falling. I, I feel like I can only take a good picture of somebody if I fall in love with them. And that isn't like, hey, I want to go to bed with you. I mean, I can fall in love with... I could fall in love with anything or anybody. And I, I think that the trick for me has always been like, if, if I want uh, somebody to, to, to actually stop and look at an image or really love an image, then they have to fall in love with that thing. And the only way they're gonna do that is if I physically fall in love with that thing. Because then through my, through my, um, my focus and my obsession, over whatever that thing is mm -hmm. you do have to be obsessed uh, then I'm, I'm i'm capturing that um and more often than not i feel like it's it's easy for me to fall in love with faces and, and people um and there's something very human about doing portraits mm -hmm. 
Um, and so I think that if I was to do something that was just sort of passion oriented, it would be some sort of portraiture, I think, you know, and I, I really still love black and white. And, you know, I was trained in film school on black and white, but I, I love the simplicity of it. And I like how it sort of takes all of these options and sort of smashes it down to monochrome. Mm -hmm. And it says, hey, look, it, the colors don't matter, you know this location which in color would look pretty dumpy actually looks really great or, or the emotion is just more important than yeah and then it's color. you're really just sort of focusing in mm -hmm. on and on face but also like um like a body and like what the emotion the body can convey mm -hmm. you know a posture and stature um those things have always really interested me and i i think some of my best work is still that is still falling in love with people and, and capturing them. And I, you know, honestly, I, I never really knew that when I started, I thought that it was all technical and mm -hmm. it was like, okay, so here's this little box that's got all these buttons and dials on it. And strangely, I control how wide it opens and it controls the amount of sunlight coming into it. And wow, this is like a little wizard box, especially before digital when it's film, you know, because it's like, okay, so film's a living thing and you know, what the fuck? And so all of that was really fascinating to do but in that obsession and i think a lot of people do this in that obsession i became very closed off you know you're in a dark room by yourself you're like curled over your camera well and so much of our job is alone yeah <laughs> yeah and so then you become sort of this unapproachable artist and you become like sort of this hermit at least i did when i first started and i was like very in that and like I was saying earlier, it wasn't until I realized that, um, yes, you need to have those skills. But at the end of the day, what is in front of the camera is actually more important than what you're shooting with on how you exposed it or any of that stuff. Like what you're capturing is probably the most important thing. Having good gear is ideal. I mean, I was shooting on a D3000 and going to a D800, holy shit, I could take photos at night, which was just a whole field I wasn't even... <laughs> yeah, but you can take you can take a you can you can take a fucking amazing photograph with an like an Instamatic or like a Polaroid. Very true, but capabilities, uh, more options. Yeah, well, I mean, then you start to get into you start to get into the detail, and you start to get mm -hmm. into the fact that oh, well, I want this to taste a little different, and I want this to give I want this to feel a little bit different. But ultimately, it's all about what you're capturing. I think yeah. the beauty in a lot of your images isn't the fact that. You know, you're shooting with a fucking amazing megapixel fucking camera. Yeah, because a lot of my images are blurry yeah. on purpose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have the eye and you have sort of an obsession with women and posing. Yes, and posing. Yeah. You have a very specific obsession with posing and a very strange uh, view on how to capture ladies, which I think is interesting. You know, and it, it's, it's really your perspective and your personality that comes out of that stuff. That's more important than all the gear and all For that sure. shit. You know what I mean? For sure. And I think it's a big myth that uh, you just, like, how to get started. I feel like I was fortunate enough to have somebody who invested in me in the beginning because it's a myth to think that you can just afford all the stuff you'll need or... I don't know. I feel like that was an important thing to talk about. <laughs> oh, what? Like actually being able to photo the gear? I mean, fuck that. I, I honestly don't think that you need to buy anything. And I think that maybe you need to have some sort of camera to play with, but you just need to know somebody with a camera to play with. And if you just get your hands on the cheapest thing that you could possibly have that'll capture frame and that will swap lenses, ultimately that's all you need. Like if you, even now, I don't own a, you, you own the camera. I've been doing this for how many years? I don't own a camera. I don't own one. I don't own a photography camera. And if I gotta oh, go- Oh, I don't own one. No, I mean, I'm not trying to be an asshole about it. The truth of the matter is, is that I'm keeping my overhead down. So like, if I'm gonna go do a shoot for somebody that wants me to do a shoot, I'll go rent a camera for those two or three days and rent those lenses for those two or three days, which will cost me maybe $400. For, I, for that one shoot is instead of me going out and blowing you know thirty five hundred dollars on a camera and i'm not shooting every day so i get that like if you're physically doing enough work where you're shooting every day and it, the, the cost plays out like that but then how do you keep up with the toys what toys 
Mm. You know, the, the photography toys, the camera toys, all the gear. Yeah. How do you keep up with it? You're spacing out. Look at you. Well, you, you're talking a lot, and then I lose everything that I was trying to say somewhere <laughs> along the lines. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to stop all of you. Okay. It's okay. This is your podcast. What were you, what were I am you, but a simple plebe. What were you, what were you saying? What were you saying? Uh, I don't know. Also, I feel like we should preface some of this because this is just rants that we've continued for years, and maybe it's beneficial to some of the people that just want to get into photography, like the fears that you you've kind of touched upon like the, f- the fear of how to come up with an idea and this like i i at least thought that everybody just had ideas and the good people always knew you know from the beginning exactly what they wanted which is definitely no. not the case it's not true at all <laughs> and usually you have to be pushed into spending the hard time researching something and finding something you love and then asking other people and i mean none of this stuff happens overnight no not at all None of it. And I mean, sure, you may wake up with an idea. You may wake up with like a really vivid image of something and then you struggle to capture that. But even then, that just doesn't happen. It's not like you roll out of bed and have a dream and you go, oh, I got this great idea. And then you go pick up your camera and then you you shoot that idea. Yeah, find out how to produce it and get in touch with people. I have ideas that I thought were so good in the beginning and I just didn't have the skills to execute anything like the prep or and they're just sitting there maybe one day. (laughs) All of this takes time. And if it, if it takes you some time to learn how to produce, if it takes you some time um, to learn how to be inspired, that's good. That's actually great. Because then as that time progresses, you're growing and you're meeting new people and you're being influenced by new people and your work is progressing and your work is changing. Um, I almost feel bad for folks that come, whether you're a musician or whether you're an artist and you come right out of the gate and you're, you're considered a fucking genius and then you're you're because yeah, you're like Will Smith's kid, <laughs> and you're and you're at that point where you're being defined by that that instant, yeah, and that you have to maintain that. That doesn't happen, and you don't want that to happen because then you're just going to get stuck doing whatever lame thing you were doing when people thought it was awesome. Right, and I mean, I, I mean, I can only speak for myself. In my first, you know, four years of shooting photography, I think I have maybe two images that I still show people. Yeah, you got to be bad to be good. Yeah, like this is a long time of learning, mm-hmm. a long time of learning. And then, you know, like I was hinting at before, you taking on a shoot um, isn't just about you, you know, producing great images. It's about putting yourself in the uh, situation to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, my whole thing is I don't give myself options. I know what I want and I do it blindly and I learn from that because if you give yourself options then you might be too afraid to do it. That's pretty good advice, actually. You know, I think that that's the fun. Actually. That's the fun stuff. (laughs) This one hour is just that one really slow sentence. (laughs) It's pretty good advice. Surprising. (laughs) You can only see his hand on his chin right now. (laughs) Wow. You actually said something interesting. (laughs) I am a woman, but. (laughs) Nope, nope, nope. I did not say any of that. Um. But go ahead. What would I, I mean, I feel like I have to say a couple things that I would be like, that I would want to know if I was listening to myself. Not that I'm, you know, be all end all by any means. I'm just on track. Uh, It would be, I think I at least glorified, which I tried not to do today is the whole thing, like seeing a photographer and seeing their work and just imagining that everything's like perfect the way we do in society. And it's just a lot of rejection and a lot of being broke for a long time and a lot of uncertainty always (laughs) until you kind of figure out that people are always going to either love or hate what you do and one person who loves your photo the most will be the photo that someone else just doesn't like so have a couple people that you listen to and you you get advice from and then only listen to it how often do I listen to you? Like 30% of the time? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell when you're not, when you just get that glaze or you're just, just like distracted by a puppy video on your phone. Or when Tony just noticed that I hum when I'm not interested in something. I never noticed I did that. It's so rude. <laughs> Tony's like talking and I'm hummering over him last night. <laughs> I love you, Tony. <laughs> Even now I still glorify some stuff and everybody's just been through the same struggle and it's just 
being obsessed enough with something to not give up each time it throws you down and just get better. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And I think that um, that's always going to be that way. Mm -hmm. I think that the, Forever. the day that you embrace that and the day that you know that it doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter how many magazines you've been in, it doesn't matter how big you are, every time you start a shoot, it's going to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had that. You always remind me when I have like this one big goal, and I'm, it's you know the only thing I'm working for. And you're just like, well, when you reach that, what's next? Like, if that's all you're setting up for, what? How are you going to feel once you reach that? Like, it has to just be this undying love, or at least obsession with what you do. And you know, there's always room to grow if you are open to it. And what's your favorite part as uh, about being a photographer right now? Oh, it's everything it's i don't know it's just embedded in who i am i love taking the photos i love finding awesome images i love you know planning a certain amount and then just being able to be surprised once you're on set editing sharing the photos with everybody you know sending out an email on a friday night which you tell me to never do and having to wait till monday for anyone to respond and tell me what they thought of the photos that's fun <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been good, I think. Um, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Um, is there anything that you feel like uh, people would want to know? This is the only time you'll ever be on my podcast. I know. This is my 15 minutes. This is it. You will never <laughs> be back. Uh, I think the money thing is good. I'm trying to think of all the things that I get really upset or happy about. Um, money, dealing with clients, like... We touched upon that, but then we kind of, then you kind of got on a tangent. I think that's important, and this might be a good way to talk about it. I'll keep you unbiased. Yeah, okay. So here's the problem with talking about this stuff is that it's a very frustrating thing. And it's situational. It's very situational. It's a very frustrating thing, and it's very hard to talk about publicly because you never want to be fucking yourself, essentially. Mm -hmm. But you need to be able to talk about some of this stuff publicly. So for me, I get very passionate about... Um, You're Robin Hood. No, I, I, no I, I'm not. I, I, I just, I get really upset when communication doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that 99% of our problem right now, whether it's the photo business or the movie business, is that communication is not happening. So what do you mean by communication? I mean that when someone comes up with a budget and somebody comes up with some arbitrary number to do something, they don't check with the outside world first. Too aggressive. Is that too aggressive? Yes, yes, Is that way too aggressive? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it feels that way. It feels like... like you, need to you need to like... I just want to give you a little piece of my non-cynicism for you just to like... Slightly toned down how aggressive you're either being to the client or the photographer each time you're trying to explain this. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. Uh, look, here's here, here's here's what the way I think about it. Um, I think that uh, there are a ton of talented people out there that are just dying to work, and and I love that. I love that competition. I love that community of it, and I I feel like that these folks and myself included just need to become unafraid to 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 in general become unafraid yeah it's just becoming unafraid mm -hmm. it's just it's it's being secure with saying like look this is how much i'm worth mm -hmm. like any other job like a retail job this is how much i'm worth and and Here's how I came up with these numbers. Mm -hmm. And I didn't arbitrarily sit up one day and go, I am worth, you know, $5,000 a day. It was through experience and time. And you understand this is the team I need. This is the crew I need. This is the equipment I need. This that was an arbitrary number. I need <laughs> 5,000. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But these are the things that I need in order to, 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 to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's being okay and confident to say to someone that comes to you, well, look, you don't have enough money to do what it is that I need you to do. And we can work on this together. And coming up with that number in general seems arbitrary, but you have a good system that I've implemented as well, where you write down all the individual things that you need 
you price it out, you figure out how much you want to make in the back end, uh, how much everything's going to cost out of your hands, and then how long the job's going to take you, which is way easier than just being like, okay, I'm worth this amount of money. Well, yeah, and then there's also that level, like it isn't us against the client, it's us working with the client. Yeah, of course. Because at the end of the day, you, they're another part, they're another part of that team. Mm-hmm. They're as important, if not more important, than your lighting technician, your makeup artist, because they are bringing you an idea, they are bringing mm-hmm. you an opportunity, yeah. which is a, a, a great thing. So I don't want to give off the vibe, and in my passion sometimes I feel like it does, I don't want to give off the vibe that it is us versus them. I feel like it's just, us communicating better Mm -hmm. and us sort of coming up with a system where we say to them, okay, here, you love my work. You love that photo online. That is the reason why you called me. Here's my method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the time doing that opens their eyes up. and Exactly. And here's my method. And I have to not be afraid of saying to them, you don't have enough money, but let's talk about this. And then the client going, well, that's how much we have. Mm Mm-hmm. You have to be okay with going, well, I can't take that job. And unfortunately for a lot of us, myself included, that means not paying rent and that means not eating. Oh, yeah. In the beginning, you have to do that, but slowly you'll weed out what you can and can't do. Yeah, and you learn how to stockpile your money so that you're in a better situation. But you have to be okay with saying no to jobs. You have to be okay with saying, look, this isn't right for us. And it's, I think it's so important to have somebody who's, been doing it longer that even if you don't always agree with what they do you can check in with them Mm -hmm. and definitely reach out to experienced photographers Mm -hmm. definitely reach out to your peers and talk to them and be honest with them and if you are an experienced photographer then don't feel like your your tricks of the trade are what are keeping you in business no it's your soul i mean the truth of the matter is is it's your life experiences no for sure you know i mean if you're hiring the difference between you and me we both can do the same kind of lighting you can replicate my lighting. I can replicate your lighting. Mm-hmm. You know, with some research, I can shoot the same with the same lenses that you use. You can shoot with the same. We have uh, a lot of the same Photoshop tricks. Same Photoshop tricks, all that stuff. But if someone comes to me and says, "Mike, we want you to do, uh, uh, you know, a different look fashion spread on the streets of New York City," I'd go, "Yeah, it's not really my thing." And it's because I, A, don't have that obsession, but B, I don't have those experiences. So for me to go do a shoot like you just did, cold, there's a lot of panic in the beginning because mm-hmm. I would have to go through the process of figuring out. Luckily, I have you. I can turn to you and go, how, mm-hmm. how did you do these things? Always. But there's a lot of that panic there. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a better example is uh, my buddy Steve Purcell who is a camera operator and he's done uh, amazing tv shows like american chopper uh, ghost hunters all that stuff he is like mr fucking wilderness you know what i mean like he's like there's a bear let's wrestle it and i'm gonna shoot it with a camera while i wrestle this fucking thing you know like that's his thing and he like if i get a call and someone calls me on the phone and says hey look we have this great idea we want to shoot in the fucking like we want to shoot in alaska you're going to hang off the back of a helicopter and you're going to try to uh get this guy as he skis through bears <laughs> you know what i mean i'd go i am not the fucking guy for that just because i know that i'll probably throw my back out hanging off the back of a helicopter because i've never done it before i'm probably allergic to probably fall the... out of the helicopter <laughs> yeah, i'm probably allergic to the bears you know what i mean but Steve, that's his life experience, is doing that stuff and, and shooting that stuff. So he would be my first reference. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel like me telling somebody else to hire somebody else takes me off their roster. Mm-hmm. It's me being honest with that client. And if you're having that conversation with a client, you're saying, look, I'm not right for this. We can talk all day about what I do well and what I'm great but at. But you have people that you can suggest, which doesn't harm you at all. Helping others can only really help you. Help you. Because then that client comes back to mm-hmm. you with advice we have or, and questions. You know? Awesome people. We have an awesome little arsenal of photographers and just people in the industry who just love. Oh, and, and clients. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, yeah. a lot of my passion about the, the anger that comes from this is usually these small little tiny fucking jobs that don't mean anything and you get really annoyed with them. But slowly over time, I've weeded out those clients. And so I've, I've hit this point where I'm working with really amazing people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people that when you start a job, the resources are going to be there for you to finish the job correctly. And people that actually challenge you creatively. I mean, if it wasn't for uh, Kristen that worked at the Boston Phoenix, 
challenging me when I did the covers for that magazine. I mm -hmm. never would have propelled my my professional photography career as far as, far as I did. Yep. And that's you know? true. It's like nothing happens overnight, but if you continuously work hard, the right person you're seeing your work could propel you overnight. But that's, you know, after years and years of the struggle. Right. Or, or working with the right person. Mm -hmm. I mean, just you working with uh, the stylist that you worked with on this last shoot mm -hmm. changed the way that you do things. And oh, shoot yeah. Things. For sure. So, I mean, that, that's the fun part about this whole thing. And I really want to get back to it. It's not an us versus them. It's not you versus me as photographer. It's not us versus a client. Mm -hmm. And the photographer is not, you know, the be, a, be all of what made the shoot great. It's, it's everything. It's everything. And so really what you're struggling for and what you should be struggling for as a professional is to create this atmosphere in which the perfect storm can happen as much as possible. Good clients, mm -hmm. good work, good gear, good relationships mm -hmm. with rental houses. Just a good time. Good times, man. Good times, man. <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah. If you just be a good person, like, you deal with everything. Don't become jaded. <laughs> Bad shit's going to happen forever in all aspects of life. Just... This is one of the reasons why we're such a great couple. Because I feel <laughs> like I've hit that point where I'm just drowning in cynicism and you're just so bright and happy and optimistic and it really pulls me back out. Yes, and you make sure I don't get run over like a deer in headlights. <laughs> <laughs> when I just love everything and everyone. <laughs> it does. It works out really cool. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, all right. So we've been going on long enough. I think we're hitting about Do the... you think any of this will go together smoothly? I think I'm just going to print it. I, oh, think no. it's, I think it's good to go. Um, thank you for listening. Um, this episode has sounded a little bit differently because I we're dating. I <laughs> shut up. <laughs> this episode sounds a little bit different because I finally bought some new podcast equipment. Um, thanks to the help from our sponsors. Um, and I'll do a sponsor read right after this, but, uh, we finally have some real microphones and a real recording setup, which is super cool. Um, and, uh, I really appreciate everybody at home. Uh, listening and I think one of the things that I'm going to do for the next episode is sort of communicate with a lot of the folks on my Instagram account which is, has been amazing I don't know if you guys follow me but if you follow Mike Petty on Instagram you'll see that every once in a while um, I'll do posts about tell me about your life tell me about your dream job and the people that I've met through there have been really awesome and really like interesting folks um, so I think n the next episode will at least start to get into reading and meeting some of those people. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I want to thank Gina, as usual. Thank you, Gina. You're, you're welcome, Gina, <laughs> for being here on the show. Um, and I hope that uh, some of the stuff that we rambled about with photography uh, helps. Yes, hopefully. And yeah. when it's honest, at least. <laughs> yeah, it's honest and, you know, very, very well informed sometimes. Mm. Um so thanks for listening and uh dave should be back soon he just went on his uh very first feature length documentary trip to europe and i think he's back next week and i'm going to convince him to do a podcast in which i cannot wait to hear his horror stories from europe it's gonna be awesome or his fun times, rather. Gina's here. I can't wait to hear about all the happy shit that he went through. Oh, my God. It's the people be, dancing on the streets it's in France. It's going to be so cool. Yes. Everybody had such a great time. Oh, I have never sounded like that in my entire life. Oh, my God. Oh, my, oh my God, guys. I love you guys. I'll see you later. Bye. I have you have a, I have a quote. What's your I quote? Need. What are you quote? What's your quote? Like, oh, can we just keep it like that so most people stop listening at this point? Yes. You didn't plug your Anna Leibovitz quote, but I have a quote I want to plug. What's your quote? <laughs> um... It's from this amazing man called Neil Gaiman, who inspires me to no end. <laughs> and he says, uh, to be a good artist, you need uh, to always show up on time, produce good work, and never be, no wait, never be late, it's the same one. No wait, let's start over, hold on. <laughs> no, maybe I shouldn't do it, but it's so good. <laughs> Say it, go ahead. Um, to be a good artist, you need to produce good work, always be on time, and be somebody that people like. And you really only need two of those three things to be successful. That's great. That's actually a really nice quote. Thank you, Neil Gaiman. I love you. Do you want to just tag it at the end with your cell phone number just in case he's listening? Yes, please. 
Call me. <laughs> All right, that's it. I'm I'm I'm, I'm stopping this. Okay, Thanks, bye. guys. Bye, bye, bye. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of In Love with the Process. And uh, now I just want to uh, go through and thank our sponsors. Um, first up, um, our buddies, our boys over at uh, Puget Systems. Uh, because of their constant support, I was able to pick up these sweet new microphones that I'm using right now. Um, so they have single-handedly helped uh, improve the sound quality of our podcast. Um, but uh, they don't sell microphones. They actually make uh, custom PCs. Um, and if you know me and if you've listened to any of our stuff or seen any of my videos online, I completely support these guys. I have two of their um, systems, uh, their Genesis systems at our post-production offices at uh, McFarland Apache, and I love them to death. Um, and when we were making that switch, when we decided that our old 2013 Macs were not cutting it, um, and we saw the price tags for the, the new ones and basically threw up, uh, we did the research and uh, found these guys. And one of the reasons why I love Puget so much is that they are a basically a very small company that loves customer service. Um, and they have made it very easy for you to make that transition from a Mac to a PC. Um, if you are a creative, like if you're a filmmaker, if you make music, um, if you are designing 3D creatures, um, they have uh, options for you that are not only affordable, um, but also super fast uh, as far as hardware is concerned and completely upgradable. Um, and if you don't know how to upgrade stuff, they will walk you through how to upgrade stuff. Um, and one would think services like this would cost an arm and a leg, but they're very affordable, very approachable guys. Um, go over to pugetsystems.com and they've made it very simple for you. Um, if you just click on the solutions button and you can pick the software stuff that you use and they will suggest systems uh, to start with. Um, but if you want to get even more personal about it, and this is another big thing I loved about these guys, um, you can actually talk to them and tell them what you're doing and they'll build you or suggest you to build us a, a very custom system that works for you. Um, so go to PugetSystems.com and tell them that Mike Petchy sent you. Um, okay, next up, Azo Monitors. So you're color grading your latest video. And when you upload it online, the colors look completely different. Or when you watch it on TV at home, it looks way too dark. That's because you are not coloring with a color calibrated monitor. Now, for those of you who don't know what a color calibrated monitor is, um, it's a monitor that is set to show you the actual colors that you are editing. And that noise in the background is Gina taking a shower, even though I told her I'm recording the advertisements for the show. <laughs> what a bitch. Okay, anyway. So, Ezo makes, uh, or Azo, I'm sorry. Azo makes self-calibrating monitors that give you peace of mind knowing that when you slightly shift the hue or bring down the brightness that the people at home will see it the way you want it. I, myself, have a CG277 self-calibrating monitor for every project I color grade and I also use it on set when I am shooting photos and I tether because um, then I can actually see what the colors are through the camera and I can light to a calibrated monitor. It's very familiar, like those of you who are filmmakers, you understand that you need to have a calibrated monitor on set. Uh, if you're lighting to a monitor, it's the same thing with photos and it's the same thing with photos in post-production if uh, you are going to be spending that long, aggravating process of tweaking your photos, uh, you want to make sure that you're looking at the actual colors that people are going to see. So go to azo.com, uh, check out their different monitors. I know they have some new 4K ones, which I think I'm trying to get my hands on. Hello, Azo, send me that 4K monitor. Um, but go to azo.com to learn more. All right, next sponsors, my company, McFarland & Pesci. Um, this is a company that both 
uh, Ian McFarland and I have been working together at for over 10 years now. We started as, we teamed up as uh, music video directors and uh, some of us may, some of you may know us for that work. We've done stuff for a lot of heavy metal acts. We've done stuff for hip hop acts. Um, and then we uh, made the shift to doing advertising work. So we do a lot of commercial stuff and we also do our passion project stuff. So um, the fabled uh, Punisher movie that no one got to see, we made that to McFarlane Pesci. Um, Ian is doing an amazing, he's putting his finishing touches and hopefully I can convince him to be on the podcast so we can talk about it. He's putting his finishing touches on his new uh, feature length documentary called The Godfathers of Hardcore, um, which if you had to sort of put it in a box, it, you could call it a music documentary on the band Agnostic Front and the origins of hardcore music in New York City. But when you see this film, you'll understand that it is not just a music um, documentary. It's not your run of the mill. This is how we got started. And these are the songs we played doc. It's actually a really uh, heartfelt in-depth piece on um, the aging musician and the long-term effects of um, being in a band. So go to McFarlandandPesci.com. There you'll be able to see some stuff. You can also follow McFarland and Pesci on uh, Instagram. We try to keep that thing updated. Um, but uh, yeah, go to McFarlandandPesci.com to check out all the new work. Okay, let's see. What else do we got here? Okay, I once again want to thank Gina for being on the show. Um, we talk a lot about the photographs that she took. Go to GinaManning.com and you'll be able to see all of the stuff uh, that we were mentioning. I don't know if the new set for New York is going to be out yet. But I'm sure if you follow her uh, on uh, Instagram, which is like Gina underscore, uh, Gina underscore Gisella, I think is what it is. She's my girlfriend, I should know. Um, but yeah, follow her stuff. Check out her stuff. She's really cool. And she's very approachable. So if you are a young photographer um, and you find her uh, easier to approach than you do me, then drop her an email. You'll find all that stuff on GinaManning.com. Finally, this is finally. Finally, if you don't already follow me on Instagram, um, that's basically where I do most of my daily interactions with uh, fans, uh, my daily interactions with the internet. Um, so if you head on over there, you'll be able to see what we're working on, a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And I also do a lot of polling questions for my followers because uh, that little number that runs on top isn't just a number for me, it's it's those are people. And I'm curious about who actually looks at the work. I'm curious about who tunes in every day. And so more often than not, I'll do a poll and actually meet really interesting people. I'm always surprised at the folks that are following my stuff. And so I think what I might do, I'm, I'm still toying with the idea, I might just start reading and meeting these people on the podcast. We shall see. So if you want to be involved with that stuff, uh, follow me, Mike Petchy at or on Instagram. Okay. Uh, so that should do it for this episode. Um, and thank you so much for listening to In Love With The Process.